right, good afternoon everybody. My name is Ashley May. I serve as Director of Educational Technology here in Spring Branch ISD. Um, and I was asked to uh, speak to you guys a little bit today about becoming human alongside EdTech. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I was like, hmm, becoming human, this is a hard concept for me. So I kind of rebranded this as remaining human alongside technology, because I'm quite confident that we were all here before these advancements came. And so, um, I want to talk to you a little bit today about just change and how we responded to it. So uh, many moons ago, you might remember there was this virus going around and the world kind of shut down. And so we had to close our schools. And when we closed our schools, we really had to figure out how to retrofit everything that we were already doing and make it fit this new model. So there was a lot of conversation that started to happen about reading. What does reading look like when we are reading in print versus reading on a screen. We've got to think about that. We've got to make what does that implication look like for our students and how are we helping them. And then from there, we started talking about movement. Oh my gosh, my eight-year-old is just spending too much time on a screen and they're in front of the device. We can't just have this one recess anymore. We need more breaks. We need more opportunities for them to get up and for them to move around. And then that conversation continued to evolve and people rushed to take all of their worksheets and make them digital. And everybody in my field screamed because we were like, oh dear God, no, not another worksheet. But there was this idea that everybody was making gains and strides towards we're moving into this new environment, we're here, we're in this new world. How are we going to survive and how are we going to continue to educate our students? And so that happened in education and that also happened around us. It happened in business, it happened everywhere you looked. And so businesses stopped and they said, okay, what kind of things did we innovate during this time that, that worked really well that we wanna keep? What helps support our model? Look familiar to anybody? <laughs> when was the last time you, show of hands, anybody picked up groceries recently? Oh, yeah. I had groceries delivered to my house on Sunday. It wasn't raining, I was just tired, so I had them <laughs> delivered, right? Uh, Chick-fil-A, does anyone actually go inside to get their food anymore? Does anyone, sometimes, <laughs> does anybody sit there in the curbside and wonder why all those people are in the drive through They just must not have the app and they must not have been able to order their food, right? But you've got all of these other places and all of these people who said, this worked, let's yeah. keep this. This is how we got all this money. Christmas shopping. Amazon. Target Amazon. Amazon, Target pickup. Nobody is going inside to do anything anymore. If you are an introvert, you're in heaven because now I really don't have to talk to anybody unless I want to. And so we took these things and from a business perspective, they have figured out how to say, yes, this is happening and we need to keep it going. How are we doing that in education? So I want you to take a moment and think about this as a bridge. We've already crossed the bridge. We walked across that bridge, some of us in March of 2020, some of us in February, other of us in April. Some people we drug across the bridge kicking and screaming, <laughs> but either way it goes, we made it to the other side and now we're here and it's too late to decide that now we're scared and you wanna turn back and go the other way. Right. And so what are we going to do and how are we going to do those things differently? There was a lot of talk at the end of the pandemic of, oh, this is our chance, we're gonna revolutionize education. How are we doing that though? And so in preparation for this, um, I'm a self-proclaimed Twitter junkie. Some of the changes now are, are making me wean myself off, but I just threw a question out there. Uh, I'm doing a bit of research. I got an upcoming talk at the end of the month. Quick poll, when was the last time you used artificial intelligence to help you with an everyday task? What do you think the responses look like? Probably high, some higher than others. Here's what I got from the good people on Twitter, okay? So take it for what it's worth. Okay. These are the good people on Twitter. Within an hour, within 24 hours, this past week or sometime this past month, or never, what is AI? And I was like, really? In 2023, there are still people who are saying, what is AI? And you've heard it come up today. People have talked about the way AI is taking over. But it dawned on me that maybe people don't really see mm -hmm. how it has already become a part of what we do every single day. So let's take a look. Recognize that? Mm -hmm. 
Hey Siri, if you said it loud enough right now, how many people have a watch that would go off and start? Did anybody's phone go off? If we, okay, one, two, three, everybody give me a hey Siri. One, two, three. Hey Siri. Oh my God. There she goes. She's popping everywhere. That's AI. We just used it 10 seconds ago. Who's got a Roomba? You are lucky. I don't have a Roomba because I have children. When they leave, I will get one though, right? But now you don't even have to vacuum anymore. It's just got a map, it's programming, it's going all around your house. We're using it already every day. Um, your Spotify curated playlist. Oh, yeah. There's only so deep an algorithm can go before it eventually becomes like an AI. Yes. Hey Alexa, play da 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 da. Right? Something. There's a song. It's unlocking your doors. It's turning off my lights. It's turning off your lights. It's doing all those things. I, I mean, I have Siri. I don't have Alexa. I don't have any of those things. I have no smart anything in my house because I have a problem. But other people, it's everywhere. You've got a smart refrigerator. You've got a smart washer. You've got a smart dryer. And then everybody's uh, favorite commercial. Your Apple Watch can now detect that you've been in a car crash, and if you don't respond in a certain number of seconds, it is going to send help. I have accidentally called the police three times trying to silence my phone because I didn't want to turn my alarm off, and I held the button down too long. And one time, I actually heard 911. What is, I was like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I really just didn't hit send fast enough. But it's already here. And so we, we, how are we remaining who we are as humans and how are we learning how to use this to better our lives instead of allowing it to take over? And so in learning to live alongside technology, the hot button topic when anybody talks about AI right now is our good old friend, Chat GPT. And it's really only a hot topic because we hold writing so dear in our field. K-12, even in higher ed, writing is just the pinnacle of how we prove learning. Um, but AI has been around for a long time before ChatGPT came around. And the question I pose to you is how do schools respond? How do you think schools should respond to this? So there's a rush, if, you're, if you talk to my good friends on Twitter, they'll tell you that there's a rush to just block it. Show of hands, is it blocked already where you are? Yeah. Raise your hands, guys. It's okay. It's safe here, I promise. <laughs> it's blocked for students. Let's put it, it is blocked for students. And that makes perfect sense because chat GPT should be used by those 18 and over. And as a K-12 institution, we don't have anybody 18 or over. So it's blocked. Fine. That's great. But if we don't teach them how to use it, what are they going to do? So I want to give you a real life example. So full disclosure, I'm the baby of the family. I'm the youngest of five, and that means that I'm the little sister that people ask to do all the things all the time. So this is a real story. I have blocked out my sister's names because if they find out I shared this story, I may or may not still be a part of this family at the end of this talk. So one Saturday morning, I woke up to a text from my sister. She's frantic. I'm going to read it to you because the text might be a little slow. Good morning. I need a little help. I just found out that I have to give greetings at our regional event today. The theme is reconnecting our bonds, continuing our legacy. Can you help me? I have two minutes to speak. How quickly do you need this turned around? She's like, two hours. Are you kidding me? Seven o'clock on a Saturday morning, and I'm still writing papers for you all these years later. Now you need a speech. Okay, so I said, call me. So I have my sister pick up the phone, and I, hey, where are, she's in a car driving to St. Louis asking me to write a speech for her. And I'm like, okay, Angie, what do you need? Talk to me, like, what's the, what's the gist? What do you need it to say? And I'm thinking to myself, there's a third sister in this thread, by the way, who is faking sleep as, as this is happening <laughs> so that she will not have to help. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm on the phone with her, get what you need, and I'm sitting there and I look at my husband, and I was like, I cannot believe she did this again. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna put this in chat GPT and see what happens. So I took her request, I figured out exactly what she needed, and I put it in chat GPT, and I took the first response it gave me, and I copied and pasted that into a note on my iPhone, and I shared the note with her. And then, because I wanted to see how, how well it could potentially work, I gave it a slightly different prompt, mm -hmm. and then I had it spit out a second response. And then because I'm an adult, 
and I know how to write pretty well most of the time when it's not seven hour, you know, two hour turnaround at seven o'clock on a Saturday. I then took those pieces and put them together and I said, okay, here's my edited version. So I have gone to the AI and I have said, this is what I need once. And then I have slightly changed it and I've gone to the AI and I've said, this is what I need the second time. And I took what the AI gave me, combined it and edited it edited it to form this beautiful one and a half minute greeting so she could stand up in her all white as the president of her chapter of whatever this organization is and give her greetings, okay? And I give that to her, I share the note with her, I call her because she doesn't know how to get a shared note. I'm like, just wait for the text to come through. <laughs> I walk her through all those pieces. She pulls up the shared note. She says, okay, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. And I was like, okay, let me tell you, it's a shared note, you can edit it yourself. Mm -hmm. So she goes in, she edits her pieces, and it's done. Mm -hmm. And that took all of 20 minutes of my time on a Saturday morning. So very conveniently, the other sister chimes in, hey, sorry, just woke up. What can I do? And my response was, no worries. I just used AI to write it for her. We're done. And that's a real life example of how working with this made my life easier. And so we're all running to the gate to block this thing from our students. And the reality is they're not using it on our network anyway. They're using it on their phone. They're using it on their watch. They, are, they brought their own device to school and they've connected to their own hotspot. And everything they want to do is still at their fingertips. So what are we going to do with that? If the rise of artificial intelligence disrupts our traditional classroom, I think we all agree that it does. Do we all agree that that's a good thing? Because I'm a proponent of that. It's a good thing. In my field, we've been telling people for years, if I can Google all the answers to your test, then maybe make your activity not Googleable, right? We just make up a word. But the reality is, if your AI bot can answer your final exam, then maybe you need to reconsider what you're doing with your final exam. And so we've got to teach our students how to use these tools for their benefit, how to work alongside of them, how do they live with them, as opposed to if we never teach them how to use them, then they either abuse them or they're scared of them. There is no other option. And we know that if we're not teaching them how to use them, no one else is, no one we want teaching them how to use them, right? Because if we're not teaching them, then they found it on YouTube, their friend told them X, Y, and Z, and now only God knows what they have figured out mm -hmm. that this can do. Yeah. And so as educational leaders, what I want to pose to you today is this idea that we have to make sure that our students are digitally literate. We all agree on that. Everybody's got some kind of a digital citizenship curriculum they roll out. You've got your acceptable and your responsible youth policies. We're always talking to kids about what they should and shouldn't be doing, but are we teaching them how to use these tools more responsibly, right? And so are we providing opportunities for them to experience creativity, communication, problem solving, critical thinking. Those are the things that we should be providing for them. And so the graphic that I put up here is the nine elements of a really good digital citizenship program. And if you think about the rise of AI and where we're going as a, as a society, everything that we're facing still falls under the same category. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is still just technology, which still means it's our responsibility to help students use it responsibly. So what I wanna leave you with is this idea that if we're gonna pay attention to those things, it's still gonna help us create those responsible citizens. So you heard Dr. Blaine speak earlier about our T24 um, characteristics of a T24 ready graduate, right? So are they academically prepared? Are they ethical and service minded? Are they empathetic and self-aware? Persistent and adaptable? You should be a resourceful problem solver, communicator and a collaborator. Those things are all still aligned to what we do in this field and how we're trying to prepare our children for this future where chat GPT is just the beginning. You saw Tim's slide earlier. By the time we get to the next iteration of this thing, it's going to be beyond our control. And at some point, we've got to make more of an investment into developing our students into who we want them to become so that they have control over their future. And it's not about our fear, it's not about what we're worried about, but it's about preparing them for what is to come. And so you got this pamphlet earlier. I would encourage you to take some time during your lunch. I think the food is here now, but I would encourage you to take some time during your break 
to kind of read through, we've got it split out at every level and it actually does address those components of what it looks like to be a responsible user of technology as you're exhibiting all of those characteristics. And so um, thank you for your time today. Um, and that's all I got.